All right, the book of Colossians. Uh, this is lesson number eight in uh, our series, Colossians for Beginners. Uh, we're at uh, chapter three. We're going to try to cover 11 verses, one to 11 uh, this morning. Let's review a little, shall we? So far in this letter, uh, the Apostle Paul has been defending the church against the influence and the doctrines of false teachers that have crept into this particular uh, congregation. We said that these teachers were promoting doctrines that denied the all sufficiency of Christ and His sacrifice to accomplish salvation. In other words, they were, they were suggesting that the Colossians needed further teachings and adherence to Jewish law in order to be saved, in order to be legitimate Christians. They also boasted of superior spirituality because of their claim to have certain visions, certain secret knowledge that wasn't available to others, and for that reason, they should be listened to and follow. So Paul, in response, demonstrates that Christ is preeminent in every domain, being the authority, regardless of the dimension. Uh, we've talked about that chain of authority that begins with God and goes all the way down to uh, the underworld. The, uh, he is the connection, if you wish, uh, the preeminent connection between God and the creation, God and mankind, God and the church, even God and the, the underworld, because He'll judge the underworld. He also shows that response to Jesus' teachings accomplish everything that is needed for uh, salvation. Um, he even describes this in a particular way, you know, taking a page out of the false teachers. They're, they're promoting circumcision. And, and Paul uh, says that uh, Jesus has performed a spiritual circumcision in the waters of baptism, uh, which give uh, an individual uh, a regenerated life and unity with Christ and God. Once he's completed his response to the false teachers by exhorting the Colossians not to fall for their schemes, you know, their false ideas, uh, uh, or rather their false claim of authority, their false show of spirituality, you know, don't fall for that, he tells them. He goes on to develop the true doctrine of Christ in regard to Christian living. Now he's dealt with what the false teachers said concerning how to become a child of God, now he's going to teach them Christ's way to live an ethical and a pleasing life before God because they had all kinds of rules that you had to follow if you wanted to be pleasing before God and these involved the food laws and uh, you know, uh, uh, not to be married you know, uh, was, uh, was a higher calling than, than, than marriage and so on and so forth. So uh, Paul is going to uh, show them or teach them you know, what is true Christian living? What is true ethical Christian living all about? So we, we start with the fourth section of this epistle, which demonstrates Christ who is preeminent in ethics. In other words, right or wrong living is dependent upon what Christ teaches, not, not what these false teachers teach, okay? So in chapter three, Paul will begin by summarizing everything he has already said and presenting it as the basis for the rest of the section that we're going to cover. So if Jesus' doctrine is preeminent, then the lifestyle that flows from it will also be superior to the lifestyle that comes from the teachings that the Judaizers are offering up. Okay. So when we talk about standard of living, you know, when we talk about standard of living, usually we mean how wealthy a person is or how many things we possess, or what advantages of lifestyle we enjoy in comparison to the very rich or the very poor. You know, we talk about our standard of living. So Paul, he, he talks about a standard for Christian living which compares our life not with earthly well or values, but with a heavenly or a spiritual standard that's set by Christ. So when he's talking about a standard of living, he's talking about the standard that Jesus establishes for the Christian life. So as that, you know, using that as our introduction, let's go into our text. Chapter three, verse one a, he says, therefore, if you have been raised up with, with Christ. So he begins by reaching back to the previous chapter to pick up the idea of baptism, where he previously explained that Christ makes new creatures 
of them. At baptism, their old nature of sin is removed, sin is forgiven, the Holy Spirit is given to them, and a new person emerges. So he says, therefore, you know, now that you're Christians, now that you have this new life, and he's explained all of that in the previous chapters, he says that um, if this is what has happened to you, in, in baptism, you, know, you were raised up from the death of sin and condemnation, just as Christ was raised up from His grave. Then he says, and now we go to 1b, he says, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So if you've been raised up with Christ, then you have a new standard of living to which you now strive for. The, the standard is the one established by Christ, who is in heaven. And again, in parenthesis, he doesn't say it here, but between the lines, not these Judaizers. They're not the ones that are going to set the standard for your life. It's Christ who sets the standard for your life. So that Jesus is at the right hand of God in heaven is an exalted way of saying that Jesus is divine and he has the authority of God. And if he has the authority of God, then he has the authority to establish what standard of life we should have as his followers. So what he, meaning Jesus, what he has established through his teaching, this is the heavenly or the godly standard that all should follow. Verse two, he says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. So they're to focus on the things that Christ who is above has taught and established, not the things taught and promoted by the Judaizers. I've said to you before, always keep your eye, he's always talking about the Judaizers. Things that have to do with earthly rules about food and rituals, teachings that promote the rule of the earth by demons and angels, that's what they were teaching. He said, don't, don't worry about that. Keep, keep your eyes focused on the things above, the things that, are, that have been taught from above. If you've been raised with Christ, then you are freed from earthly rules about religion, fears concerning demons. You're now living according to the true spiritual standard set by the one who is actually in heaven, not by people who just claim they had a vision. In verse three and four, he keeps going and says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Again, he refers to the death that Christians experience in baptism, but he adds that at this point, we also become united with Christ. And he uses the word hidden, because as far as the world is concerned, what we will become in Christ will not be revealed until Jesus Himself returns at the end of the world. Remember I said, when Jesus returns, those who are dead in Christ, they raised up, right? There's the resurrection. And then there's the glorification, right? The glorification meaning we take on the heavenly body. And then there's the exaltation to the right hand of God. Well, you know, the world doesn't see, can't even imagine what that glorification will be like. They can't see what that exaltation will be like. Neither can we. So he said, that's still hidden from the world, but it's not hidden from us. We're getting a little taste of it, aren't we? We're getting a glimpse of it through Christ and through the new life that we have in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit that is within us. So we, uh, excuse me, Jesus will be revealed as the glorious and only begotten Son of God, the judge of the world. And Christians will be revealed as resurrected and glorified sons and daughters of God who will live and reign with Christ forever. We hope for that. We see a glimpse of that in the future, but the world doesn't. They just see, well, these people, they're foolish. You know, they're, they believe in myths and you know, it's so sad that they deny themselves the pleasures of the world you know, because of this Jesus thing. They just, they don't get it. They don't see it. So the point here is that if this be true, that Christians are united to God in Christ and will be revealed as the glorious eternal church in the end, if this is true, then by what standard should they now live in the present? So the understated, excuse me, the unstated answer is that they certainly should not be living according to the false and quite earthly standard that the Judaizers are trying to set from them. Don't eat this, don't drink that, don't do this, don't do that, follow us, do what we say, worship the angels. 
So now he moves on to the elements of the Christian standard. So in the first four verses, Paul summarized what he will break into detail in the next several verses. The details of this spiritual, heavenly, Christ-centered standard fall into several categories. The first category is personal holiness. So he begins where the new life of the Christian begins to show itself first. And that's in the personal conduct of the individual. Remember the point here, he's saying that as Christians they are not to be enslaved to the false earthly standard of religion that is set by the Judaizers. That had to do with what they ate and cutting their flesh and worship to minor spiritual beings and submission to, to the teachers themselves. He's saying that as Christians they need to focus on the heavenly standard of the true religion established by Christ who is in heaven and who will eventually bring them to heaven as well. And so the first feature of that heavenly standard or ethic is personal holiness. So he, re, he, he says then in verse 5a, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead. So since he has encouraged them to seek or focus on the heavenly standard of holiness, Paul also adds how to arrive at, how do we get there? What's the first thing to do? Well, he says, they're to deaden their flesh, not to, not to everything, they're to deaden their flesh to sin. They've died, they've been raised up as a new creature in baptism. This new life resists the attempt by the body to reassert its old life of sin. And that's what the body, the flesh, is always trying to do. It's always trying to reassert its power over us. That's the struggle. So the admonition is quite clear. Render dead your appetite for sin. Don't offer your body up for unholy activity. And he names five things there to be dead to. Verse 5b. He says to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Four of these things are sexual in nature, one is greed. Funny how human nature has not changed in 2,000 years. Right? The culture was different, the language, the technology, the social structure, everything in their world was different. And yet we read this and we go, yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So he names these. First of all, personal holiness, deaden yourself to the first thing, sexual immorality, um, fornication. Illicit sexual activity with others includes homosexuality, adultery, all of that type of activity. He mentions impurity, another word in some of your Bibles, uncleanness, filthy talk, pictures, stories of a se sexual nature. The third thing, passion, uh, another word, lust, a yearning for what is forbidden. Another man's wife is forbidden and so on and so forth. You see what I'm saying? Uh, evil desire, evil desire, a constant desire for evil or impure things, sexual obsessions, and so on and so forth. Greed, funny he mentions greed. Greed figures in here because greed always wants more of the things above. Never satisfied with the things above. All of these usually come together, produce the sin of idolatry, how does that work? These you know, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, how does that you know, equal the sin of you know, idolatry? Well, the worship of sensuality and sexual gratification rather than the worship of God, that's idolatry. You know, the hedonistic philosophy, the idea that it's all about pleasure, it's all about gratification. So long as I'm gratifying my desires, it's okay. It's a wonderful world. Back in the 60s and 70s, they called that the playboy philosophy. Hugh Hefner you know, became a multimillionaire, you know, promoting the hedonistic lifestyle. Hey, are you kidding me? Life is all about simply satisfying whatever urges you have, especially sexual urges. And he built his, quote, empire on this idea. Paul says, that personal holiness begins with the control, the deadening of the flesh to temptations in the most basic area of life, and that is human sexuality. 
Let's keep reading. Verse six and seven, he says, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. No mincing of words here. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. So he reminds them that this type of activity will be punished by God. They must not be fooled by high-minded ideas that indulge in sexual immorality. For example, you know, homosexuality finding acceptability under the banner of political correctness. And certain churches, they say, you know, we're inclusive, we're inclusive. You know? Uh, we, we include everybody. You, know, you don't have to change. Well, who doesn't want to go to a church where you don't have to change anything? I mean, there's some churches out there that call themselves churches. You don't even have to believe in God to be able to be a member of that church. What a wonderful feeling that must be like. So these type of activities and attitudes are wrong and God will punish on account of them. Don't be fooled, he said. And he's saying, don't be fooled, why? Because in the world there will always be people who will apologize for these things, who will try to make these things right and good even and acceptable. He also reminds them that they were once guilty of these very things, considered them as a normal part of their lives. But since the resurrection in Christ, they now live according to a new standard where they are to refuse their body's desire for these things. Now don't misunderstand the scripture here. Paul is not promoting celibacy as the false teachers were. He's promoting proper sexual conduct. He's not saying deny yourself sexual conduct. He's saying deny yourself illicit sexual conduct. This line also serves as a bridge to the next verse where Paul will list another group of sins that they are to avoid. Verse eight. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. So the first group of sins, according to Linsky, who is a, a writer, a Greek scholar and, and commentator, uh, the first group of sins brings harm and offense to one's own body, sexual sins. Paul says, you know, when you sin sexually, you sin against your own body, he said. The next group of sins bring harm to other people. And so what does he say? Personal holiness also means deadening our flesh to anger, the boiling of emotions, allowing ourselves to be stirred by negative feelings towards other people, wrath. This is a stronger form of the first, where the emotions threaten to boil over, the end of control. Uh, exasperation, that's wrath. Malice or meanness, where our unchecked emotions begin to form into some sort of evil action or evil words. Slander, the first and most common mean act is to speak against someone else, to curse them or to speak negatively about them. And then he says abusive speech, foul, abusive language in regards to other people and this being a constant attitude. So along with verse five, this makes a list of 10 things to resist in the pursuit of holy living. It's not a comprehensive list of every sin there is, but the fact that Paul refers to sins of sensuality and those of speech shows that he's including all the earthly evils we desire in our hearts and the evils we commit as a result of what comes out of our heart. Sex is in our heart, I mean, uh, illicit sex is in the heart, uh, abusive speech is what comes out of the heart. So the resurrected man, the resurrected woman, has a new heart which neither desires these things or produces these things, and it's evident. Finally, personal holiness requires a new approach to personal relationship with other people, and that is our approach based on truth. So we read verse nine. He says, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Always goes back, remember, you're a new creature. You don't practice these sexual sins, you don't practice these you know, speech sins or attitude sins, and, 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 and you have a new attitude towards what is true, what is true. So Paul returns to the historical moment when the old man, the old sinful, the old devious nature was removed and replaced by the new purified holy nature 
put into place. And of course that moment was baptism. Because this has happened, they must leave off the sin of lying. And you know sometimes it's harder to leave off the sin of lying than it is the sexual sins. Because lying creeps into so much of what we say and do. So in verse 10, he says, and having put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. This is especially necessary because this transformation was made in order to bring them back to their true and original form. Before sin, Adam was the true image of God, sinless, pure, new God. He lost this status because he sinned and he was plunged into darkness and separation and death. And all humans shared this fallen nature after him. So Paul is saying now that Christ has renewed man back to his true nature, sinless, having a relationship with God again, then man's responsibility is that he must be truthful in his relationship with other people. Verse 11. He says, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freedman, but Christ is all and in all. So he summarizes the last few verses. This renewal is not simply a change of ethics. It's not simply you know, a new set of moral rules. It's a complete change that occurs to anyone who experiences the saving power of Jesus Christ. His point is no matter who you are, and in saying that no matter who you are, he, he mentions several sets of disparate people. For example, let's put it this way. He says Greek, no matter who you are, Greek and Jew. Well, what was the difference between Greek and Jew? Culture. No matter what difference in culture you have. Circumcised and uncircumcised. No matter what difference in your past religion is concerned. He mentions barbarian and Scythian, civilized versus uncivilized. And then of course, slave and free, whatever social position. So no matter what culture or religion, no matter what position in society and so on and so forth, no matter what group you formerly identified with, you were a sinner. You did not know the truth. You were lost in sin. But because of Jesus, you have become a new creature. You've become this new thing, not a Scythian or barbarian or anything like that. You've become this new thing, a Christian. Now as a Christian, none of these labels means anything anymore. Oh, I mean, you can identify yourself. Yes, you know, my dad was Italian, my mom was French. Sure, you can do that. Explains why you speak certain languages. But they have no meaning anymore other than that. You've been liberated by the truth. You know the truth that God renews everybody through Christ. And now you must live according to this truth. So part of leaving off these old labels is to pursue personal holiness. And part of personal holiness is to speak the truth since they were renewed by the truth. You see the, the book ends here. You were renewed by the truth. Therefore, you need to speak the truth. You know, what a dichotomy if you're renewed by the truth, but you go on being a liar. <laughs> and who do you lie to the most? Self. Self is the person you usually lie to the most. You rationalize for yourself, you tell yourself things to make yourself feel good, feel better, whatever. So in the end, everybody comes together in Christ because everybody is focused on Him and the heavenly things that are connected to Him. All right, so let's, uh, again, a long section here. Uh, let's just summarize this. I don't want to go further. We'll pick this up next time. So in this third chapter, Paul explains the standard or the ethic for Christian living established by Jesus, who is now in heaven. He encourages his readers to focus on this standard rather than the false and earthly standards that the Judaizers were trying to impose on them. This heavenly standard reflected their new status as spiritual beings renewed and purified by the blood of Christ in baptism. And this heavenly standard included several elements. Now today we looked at the first of these elements, which was the pursuit of holy living. 
and the pursuit of holy living required the denial of certain evil desires and the effort to speak the truth to everyone. So you know, you have a lot of, you have this little booklet, that, which I found very helpful. I've used it in the past in my ministry. You know, it's called uh, Now That I Am a Christian. I think you preachers know that, and those of you who've done personal work know, Now That I'm a Christian. And it's just a handy little booklet about you know, being uh, faithful to services, and now that you're a Christian, so on and so forth. You know, the things that we do, and, uh, you know, to prepare your offering and to uh, read the word each day and very, very helpful as a, as a beginner's type thing, you know, to, to get someone started who's simply, who's just been baptized. But I think that that little booklet would be incomplete if we didn't mention this. Where do I begin living like a Christian? How do I start doing that? Well, Paul is saying this is where you start right here. You begin by aiming at personal holiness and he breaks down what does personal holiness require of you. All right, holy living required the denial of various evil desires and the effort to speak the truth to everyone. All right, next lesson, we're going to move on to the next element in the heavenly standard. So we had personal holiness. Next element in the heavenly standard, a loving attitude. Again, too long to go into this lesson. We'll pick it up next time. All right, that's it for today. Appreciate your attention.